Let us rock and roll. <laughs> Welcome back. Another episode, C Suite Unfiltered. How's it going? Good. Good? Yeah? How, how's my candy's been recently? Not sleepy enough, but it's okay. Okay. Anything in particular? Why? Is anything keeping you up at night? No, just getting stuff done. All right. Cool. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, if there's anything you want to talk about, feel free. Chime yeah. in. Cut me off. I but, got my non-financial advice locked oh, and good. loaded. Nice. As yeah. do I. As do I. All right, good. So... I'm going to jump in here to an article that I was recently looking at. It's very interesting. A lot of information about the lawn care and landscape industry. Wanted to get some of your thoughts on just generally some of the metrics and one personally wondering if some of these are accurate based on what you know, but also any trends that you're seeing based off of some of these metrics. So this article has uh, like 21 different metrics for the lawn care and landscape industry. It's actually uh, an article through Jobber. So Jobber put all this data together, but it's not just data from Jobber. Obviously they supplemented with theirs, but they're using Statista. They're using National Association of Landscape Professionals. They're using Lawn and Landscape, uh, various different resources to pull this data together. Interesting article. Okay. The U.S. landscaping market generated $176 billion in revenue in 2023. So I might just highlight a few of them and we can jump around. This one, this is point number two. So this is the one that I, I took a step back on. Love your thoughts on this. 65% of landscaping businesses earn over $1 million per year. Uh, It's not true. I know it's not true. So they put their source as jobber. So my assumption is, are they saying 65% of their users generate more than $1 million per year? Right. And I'm not asking you, this isn't like a job or a co-pilot. Let me just be oh, clear. Oh, no, no, I really like jobber. <laughs> yeah. These these metrics thing things they put are really good. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, so I, I, I want to make sure that's fact. clear. This isn't me like bringing up a job or topic because you own co-pilot. Yeah. Not at all. I just want to talk numbers. That number did not make sense to me. I was like, 65% of landscaping businesses earn over $1 million per year. Yeah. I'm assuming they're, are they talking about landscaping as in project only companies or are they just eliminating the fact that there are hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds of thousands, but thou- tens of thousands of people that aren't like registered doing business. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what is six to the 11th power? Oh, or like, like that. What yeah. is that? I don't know what that total number <laughs> oh, you know, is. I, if I turn it this way, you go, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so if the, if the lawn care industry was $600 billion, yeah. then that would make sense. Because yeah. they're saying that there are that these million dollar companies and the 60th percentile would then assume that the average company is above a million. Mm-hmm. If you actually run that math. So if I just assumed a million, not above, there's 600,000 landscaping companies in the country. So that'd be 600 billion. That's a great point. You actually, yeah, you, you can debunk it right there because it says there are 641,782 landscaping and lawn maintenance businesses registered in the United let me States. Think how they could come up with that though. Like if they said that there's a reason why, let me give me a thought. Well, let me click there now. 65% of them make a million of dollars or more. Yeah. 65% of landscaping businesses earn over $1 million per year. Yeah, that's not true. I know. That I was very confused by that. Was it, did they mean 6.5? <laughs> yeah, it might have just been a typo. Because like, yeah, because like I, I just know what these numbers are. Like, it, it's not. So like, um, the last one that I saw that was, that's, that's been tracked for a long time was less than 3% get over a million. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, yeah, I just don't know what sample size they're pulling from. Yeah, and they're just saying, they said jobber as their source, but then you click it, it doesn't like lead to another article. You yeah, know, I know what their their averages are. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it's weird. I don't know why how they yeah. come up with that number. Could be a typo. I think it might just be a typo. Okay. I think it might be 6.5%, and that would be more li- realistic because anyone using software will skew higher. And so, um, for example, like in, in Copilot, it's it's around twelve to fifteen percent, depending on the industry. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just because like if you have software, you immediately know this company is more legitimate. Right. So you cut the six hundred thousand down to like three hundred thousand. Right yeah. Off the rip. So it, you skew higher immediately. Yeah. Like the number one thing you can do in any home service business is just get software because you will just statistically make a bigger business. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so. Yeah, it'd be interesting. It, it's probably a typo. I'm guessing. I, I just know that's not true. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, and uh, we're not here to nitpick. No, Once again, I want to be clear. It's just a dot. We're Mike probably I, literally missing a dot yeah, here. Mike and I are numbers guys, so I wanted to bring just these numbers and, and hear your thoughts. And yeah, because their next item is right. 641,000 landscaping businesses in the U.S. Yes. Which means literally this, the industry would be bigger than like, 
the entire telecommunications <laughs> industry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like bigger than internet. Bigger market cap than like Dream, T-Mobile. Do <laughs> nine percent of landscape. You can cut some of this stuff out. Let me just read through this. Good. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I really like those reports. Yeah. I just that's a typo. It's got to be yeah. a typo. <laughs> yeah. So the landscape industry has grown by eight point two percent annually over the past three years. That's pretty cool. Uh, this was an interesting stat. Now this is from landscape management. I'm assuming it's just like some sort of poll. Sorry. The- it's it's safe to say that there's <laughs> no industry where sixty five percent of people that start a business have a million dollar business. Yeah. Like if you blend the whole thing, it's ten percent. Like if you take all industries and blend it all, about 10% of businesses, it's like 9.1, I think it was last, mm-hmm. we'll get above a million. Okay. So to say that this is this industry, we get 65%, man, that basically means that you skew like the average, like 1.2, 1.3 million is the average revenue per. Right. So anyways, it just, you're good. There's something wrong there. <laughs> You get frustrated when numbers don't add up. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, you're good. But this is an interesting thought, and and this is you know an emotional take here. Uh, I'm assuming this is from a poll. Once again, I did not look into the sources. I just looked into the article itself. 69% of landscaping and lawn care businesses are optimistic about the future outlook. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I feel like on the pages I'm a part of, and even some of the internal conversations we have with Augusta, we're not doom and gloom. We're not fearful, but we are preparing. Obviously, we have an election year coming up, Lee getting political. Uh, you know, people are nervous. Inflation's on the rise. Harder to find labor. Uh, you recently talked uh, on one of your, um, was it on your cha- one of your channels or... Oh, no, it was the Memphis meetup. I was re-listening to your presentation you did at the Memphis meetup to the owners about how labor is getting harder and harder to find and getting more and more expensive. So I found it interesting that this poll says 60, 69% of businesses are optimistic. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like I always like to, I just like to see the numbers. I yeah, just want to see yeah. the data. How did you collect this data? Who did you survey? Um, because, for example, surveying um, like home service industry, there is a definite leaning politically. So when they think that there's going to be a change in the leadership of the country, like that will affect the way that they pull. Um, also, are these larger businesses? Are these smaller businesses? Is this recurring based services or right. project based? Because I know that from, from what I've talked to and what I've seen, like the project parts, they're the ones that are feeling more pessimistic. Recurring, they've had a really good year this year where they've still been able to raise prices. Mm-hmm. Like we it's been like a bad economy and we raise prices like across the board at augusta lawn care yep most of our locations by 20 to 30 percent and no one bad in an eye yeah yeah um and so i think there is okay, i was gonna use verb word uh there's a splitting of uh, like the different of like recurring versus projects mm. and then size of business um and so i think also it depends on like where you're at in terms of are you at capacity if you're at capacity i feel like you're going to be pretty good because you've been able to raise prices up to yep. this point without any kickback. Mm-hmm. And so I think that will only change when the economy gets bad enough to when you raise prices, you lose 30, 40% of your customers, but it's going to be offset by the fact that we're going to be able to find cheaper labor mm-hmm. or like, I shouldn't say cheaper, just labor will be easier to find. Yep. And therefore the cost of retraining people, leaving, et cetera, will go down. Yeah, totally. So this is a, a section in this article on pricing. I'm going to hit you with these three stats. All right. In 2022, the landscaping uh, uh, industry operating expenses uh, compared to 2022, excuse me, grew 9.8%. Very big growth there. The average homeowner is willing to spend $300 per month for general la- general landscaping services. And on average, landscape companies charge between $50 to $100 per hour. What are your thoughts on not only the 9.8 percent since 2022 in operating expenses, what homeowners are willing to pay, and also hourly rates being between 50 to 100 per hour on average? Yeah, 9.8 is pretty regular. Is that from one year or two years? Well, this article is from earlier this year. They don't say if it's. No, I mean, up. like, is it 9.8 from one year to the next? That's what I'm saying. This article is from this year. Mm. They're saying. In 2022, the operating expenses grew by 9.8 percent. So from 2021, that would be my guess. Got it. Which was in line with inflation for that year, right? So um, I would say though, like in terms of those 50 to 100 dollars, it's obviously a huge range. Anyone the lower end of that is going to get wiped out. Um, they're the low price competi- competition, um, and they are have very low margins. Just because like the cost of labor going to where it's at, 
And this is why robotics will first go to commercial because commercial tends to be more in that 50 to $60 per hour range. I remember back when that was 30 to 40, mm -hmm. um, way back in the day, 10 <laughs> years ago. Um, but I do remember that like when people were bit, their budget hour rate was 30 to $40 an hour for commercial. So now it's more like 50 to 60. Mm -hmm. They're still going to be the ones that either will get priced out of the market or they will, the, the robotics will go there first mm -hmm. is commercial. And so I'd just be encouraging everyone to get above a hundred dollars per hour mm -hmm. over the next couple of years, get above a hundred. Yeah. You're gonna need it to be able to afford the labor. Otherwise you just, so then it's like, well, how do I do that? I can't just raise my price. It's like, no, you're going to have to change your value proposition to your customers. Like you're going to have to have a good website. You're going to have to have the trucks decal. You're going to have to have software. Yep. And this is why, like I said earlier, like the number one thing you can do in any home service business is just get software. Cause immediately you'll put yourself in the top bracket of revenue hmm. of like statistical. Like, so for example, if you're like trying to get rich, like do everything that rich people do. And like the right. likelihood goes up. Yep. Like if you live in the right zip code, chances are going to, you're going to go to a good school, check that box. You're probably going to go to university. You're probably going to get a good job. Like, the yep. chances of being rich go up. So like if you want to get rich in home services, just do what rich people do. It's like, oh, like all the big companies have wrapped trucks and they have really organized shop spaces and they have a great website. Mm -hmm. Like they have a good brand and mm -hmm. they've been around for 20 years. Oh, those are yeah. the things we should do. Yeah. And so if you just do those things, like the likelihood of success is much greater. Yeah, that makes total sense. And that was one thing I wanted to ask on the follow-up. Do you feel that the average, and I know markets are so different across the US, but you kind of already answered the question, the average hourly rate for most of the residential companies, and that's probably what most of the listeners to this podcast are, should be moving towards 100 and you said yes. Yeah, I'd say the average of my audience is 70 to $80 an hour right now. Right. But everyone should be moving towards that 100 in the next what? Oh, one yeah. year, two year, three years? As year. soon as you possibly can. Yeah. Because you, it'll break you away from the low price competition. Because the low price competition will stay at 50 to 60 bucks an hour. Right. And so it, it, it won't be until we get robotics that the companies that have all the money that were at 120 an hour, mm -hmm. they'll afford the robots and then you'll be able to wipe out the low price competition. Yep. This is my theory of yeah, the yeah. 20 year thing. Yeah. Um, the, the low price competition will not be able to afford the robotics. They will not be able to afford the software. They won't have admin staff to be able to run these things. And so the companies that right now go up market, get all the profit, they'll eventually be able to then go get the lower margin guys and wipe them out with robotics. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion, 20 years down the road. Yeah. Fair enough. All righty. So this is towards some of the labor statistics for the industry. Uh, so there are reportedly 1.2 million lawn care and landscaping jobs listed in the United States. Uh, nearly 90% of companies plan to grow their employee count, provided they can uh, find qualified employers. And uh, landscape employment is expected to grow by 3% from 2022 to 2032. That's from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor. And and um, this is another one that did not make any sense. Now, their source is Lawn and Landscape. So, assuming the magazine. Um, on average, landscape businesses employ 24 full-time employees. Yeah, well, that's your median. Right. Um, well, because no, no, you, it's average. It's average. So, like, that's going to be, like, a blended. Because there's people that have thousands. Well, so yeah, that was going to be my question. Because Brightview, biggest yeah. player in this industry, are they categorized as one company? That has tens of thousands of employees. But that, that's what I'm saying. It's not the median. That's going to skew. Right. Yeah, it's right. the average. Okay. Got it. That's what I was confused. I was like, is each individual Brightview location, like Augusta, considered separate? Yeah. Also, so, to be a member of, uh, at Lawn and Landscape, you're going to be a bigger business. Right. You're not going to pay the subscription fee or be a member of Lawn and Landscape unless you have a bigger business to right. because it's a lot of certification with like NALP and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. National Association of yeah. Landscape Professionals. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is another stat here. We're still kind of in the labor section. 51% of landscape companies agree that staffing is a top business challenge and will continue to be a challenge. Uh, and then let's see. I think that was pretty much the last main see, my, my thought one. was like, is 49% is of these respondents so operators? Because of course it's not going to be a problem for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I, I always like to know. Like, uh, this is the that is from the National Association of Landscape Professionals. Yeah, no, no. So that's going to get larger companies in there yeah, as well. Yeah. So fifty one percent of landscape companies agree that staffing is a top business challenge. Uh, nearly sixty percent. This is from LMN. Nearly sixty percent of landscaping businesses have one to five openings um, at any given time. Uh, and only 37%, this is once again, to your point, if you want to get rich, do what rich people do. Only 37% of landscape companies have an established employee recruiting, recruiting and retention strategy. 
So implement a employee recruiting and retention I strategy. I just want to see the data. Yeah. I don't need the percentage. Yeah. Just tell me this number of companies were surveyed. This is the average <laughs> size of the business. This is how long they've been in business. And here's the results. Yeah. I don't care about the percent- percentages. are just always all over the place. That's why I, I, I don't share a lot. Right. It's just like, man, data can be manipulated in so many different ways. This is okay. So these percentages, at least the ones I just listed from labor, those last couple are from the 2024 state of the landscape labor market report from lawn and landscape magazine. Now I can find all the data if you want, but that is, that is how this data was collected. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Yeah. There's just always going to be some sort of bias. So for example, like, um, if we survey all the members of Copilot, for example, we have a good sample set of industry wide stuff. The problem is they're already segmented massively. Like, cause you're not going to have the weekend warriors in that market. They're not going to be using software. Mm. And then it's a matter of like, yeah. So there's just a lot of, you know, yeah. inherent biases. Any kind of final takeaways from all of this data, you give, whether it be accurate or not, uh, do you feel optimistic about where things are headed? Do you feel like this is going to help Augusta stand out? Is it going to be a challenge? Like what do some of these numbers say to you? Whether or not I feel optimistic will not change the, what happens. Yeah. So I will just take what is happening and we will pivot to what needs to be done. If interest rates go down, um, which they will likely do, uh, debt will become back on the table. And so, uh, you know, the housing market will start to sell. It'll be helpful for projects. However, at the same time, if we have pain in the market uh, and people don't see their house housing prices going up all the time, like mm-hmm. they've been accustomed to, uh, they're not going to be doing HELOCs. They're not going to be doing home improvements. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the kind of like what we talked about last time, like Home Depot and Lowe's, those stock yep. prices have been stalled out because of that. And so there's, there, there's uh, I just don't know. And there's no point in like being optimistic or pessimistic about the future. Yep. It's like, I will react to what data is given yeah. and what happens. And it's so like, I know across all of long care web design and home service web design and Augusta and Copilot of like where lead flow is going. And like, I will adjust to that. And so I know across the board at Augusta that the instant price forms have increased dramatically our close rate. It has dramatically reduced our, our cost per lead. Like, you know, 20% decrease in cost per lead is like not a huge factor when you're saying, okay, we're going from $50 cost per lead to 40. It doesn't seem like a big deal mm-hmm. until everyone else can't get the lead for 40 and you can. Yeah. And so then whoever can get that, that the lowest will win. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I just... I just know what, I'm just trying to stick to like what I know will work. Getting the estimates to the customer faster will work. Mm -hmm. If we can do it cheaper because we have robotics on the road, it will work. If we answer our phone 24 seven, it will work. Like it will improve the chances 100%. I have no questions about it. And so just doing that over and over and over again and aligning it. Like if once we get credit cards to where the credit customer, when they do the instant price form can actually put their card information in, it'll be even better. Mm -hmm. Like I know that for a fact. So I'm just going to say, focus on that. What happens in the future and like my optimistic and pessimistic, I don't think I've ever replied to one of those surveys. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I also, these get skewed is who, who, who's the type of person that responds to surveys? Fair. <laughs> fair. I, I have never responded to a survey. About, yeah, it's Do you fair. feel good about the industry? That's true. I don't think I've ever responded to a survey either. <laughs> like so, just in general, like customer yeah. experience surveys, yeah. like I just don't respond to them. You're right. It's yeah. emotional, dude. Yeah. That makes total sense. All right. Cool. Well, there you go. There's your long care landscape statistics, data, data deep dive with which Mike all of which I read and I love. Yeah. By the way, totally. It's all good data points, but um, I just try to like track all where the lead, like lead. Where's lead flow? Where's the customer attention? What is going to increase close ratio? And if like I can just keep adjusting to those things in the long run, it'll be optimistic. Yeah. So there you go. If I wasn't optimistic <laughs> about the industry, I'd be out. Yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. You, you control your own destiny. Yeah. You're not going to yeah. be holding to externalities. Look, if the labor market gets worse, all your competition is going to have to downsize. The leads will come to you. Yeah. If they can't get, get employees, but you can because you can pay them more, you can afford to because they're doing P4P, because you're way more efficient, you have a great brand, so you get leads for less. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Your Economic recessions are great for you because it wipes out all the, the bottom collateral yep. that's been sapping off, you know, uh, price sensitive customers and mm-hmm. now they are forced to join you yeah. so, like it's never bad yeah <laughs> it's just like you get can get rich in a recession and you can get rich in good times right and everyone thinks good times will last forever and they just don't yeah yeah a, a healthy market is cyclical yeah. in a lot of ways yeah 100 percent. yeah so all right 
Well, let's switch it up. Okay. Totally different topic. Uh, this is a video that I will show you as well as a supplementary article. Uh, this is from ABC News, and this is, this is just a fun one. Okay. So we're just going to jump in here. This morning, San Francisco residents are fed up after being kept up at night by driverless Waymo cars honking at each other through the night as they park. I could not be more cranky today. Over the past two weeks, I've been woken up more times overnight than I have combined over 20 years. Waymo says the vehicles automatically honk their horns when other cars get too close to them while reversing. It'll be honk, 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 honk. It doesn't last very long. It only lasts like maybe... 10, 15 seconds. But imagine if your alarm clock is going off for 10 or 15 seconds. Sophia Tong has been running a 24 hour live stream, <laughs> capturing the chaos. When they all come back at once, they get into a traffic jam and they start honking at each other. <laughs> it's so silly to like think about, you know, like robots getting into traffic jams, but like here we are. Waymo says that while the feature has been working great in the city, they didn't anticipate it would happen so often in their own parking lots. Adding, we've updated the software so our electric vehicles should keep the noise down for our neighbors moving forward. And experts say don't hesitate to voice your concerns when new tech impacts your community. Anyways, Waymo, autonomous cars yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. They are getting in their own traffic jams in their own parking lot. Yes, um, any reactions to that? It's just new technology. <laughs> like, there's always going to be little blips in the radar. The thing that I love about this is they're like, yeah, okay, that's a problem. Great, we'll fix it. And then through software, over the air, they will fix the problem. And that yeah. will, they'll do a geolocation over that parking lot and say, inside of this parking lot, do not beep your horn. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. And they probably fix this in a matter of like a week or two. Yeah. So I love it. It was a bug in the system. They fixed it. Yeah. And so like this will just get better and better. Yeah. But yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> that was pretty funny too. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. Um, so they were, they were basically, the residents obviously all complained because they're just beeping all throughout the night because it's taking them hours to park. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. It's just a software update. Do you feel like, because San Francisco has really leaned into obviously, you know, kind of Silicon Valley, all those tech startups, right? Uh, the guys on the All In podcast talk about this all the time. Do you think that these like autonomous cars are just going to become more and more common across major cities? Like when do you believe that autonomous rideshare taxi services will become very common in like metropolitan cities across the US? I don't know, 10, 20 years. Yeah. You think it's still that far out? Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Because of all these little things they have to figure out along the way. Yeah. Like this, this is obviously minor. Obviously it's mm -hmm. a disturbance and people are annoyed of course, but it's minor, right? It's honking, it's noise. It's not like people are dying but they just have to get through hundreds of these little bugs before they can go mainstream with it. Yeah. And before the consumer feels that it's, it's safe, if you will. Yeah. There's like, a, there's like adoption socially. Then there's like the technological issues. Then there's the legal, like mm -hmm. from a regulation standpoint that they have to get through. Yep. But yeah, it'll just take like 10 to 20 years. Yeah. What are your thoughts on these? Would you, Wait, if you, you're in San, I, I would you're in San Francisco. To yeah. Hop in one, <laughs> yeah dude. Totally. I would love to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, Bring it back to lawn care landscaping. I think these will be a huge component uh, and potentially right. could help bring in robotics on the mower side. Because like money will go into this first because it's a bigger market. So if you can use the, the car to bring the mowers ahead of your crew, because like the mowers at first are going to be slower, right? then that would be super helpful. Um, so like right now, there are companies that do the whole like one crew puts out the mowers and like goes all, and then someone, another crew comes behind them. And does the other work and then picks up the mowers, essentially, mm -hmm. like the day after, for example. Right. Um, so I think that could potentially work. There's just so many different scenarios like rain that cause the robots not to be able to work right now for mowers. Mm. But this technology would be super helpful. It was like, okay, you can literally get an entry-level worker that doesn't need a driver's license. Now, to be the weed whacker and blower, mm -hmm. sit in the passenger seat and have the mower in the back and you drive to yeah. the property, you push a button on the mower, it does all the robot stuff, and then you got someone that's very unskilled, and in a lot of industries, unemployable, and you're able to uh, have them do the work. Yeah. Because they don't need a driver's license now. 
So you're saying you don't even want auto- just autonomous mowers. You want autonomous trucks. Oh, yeah. I think the auton- autonomy of the trucks will happen before the robotics, uh, like the autonomy of the mowers. That's, that's cool, too, looking at it from an employee side. Like, even if you are, say, a high performer uh, and you do have the skills, it, you get a break. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and then you can get a lower lower tier of labor. Yeah. And everyone hates me when I say that. But, like, yeah. that's just the truth. We can get a lower tier of labor if they do not have to drive. Mm-hmm. And if it, I think that will happen more like in the 10 to 15 year range and we the more like the 15 to 20 year range where the mowers themselves become robotic because there's not enough money in robotic mowers. Yeah. And it's so, to these. Right. <laughs> and, and as someone who's done hundreds of interviews for frontline and team members at Augusta, um, it's an automatic disqualifier if they yeah. don't have a driver's license. It doesn't matter if they have five, 10 years of experience in the lawn care landscape industry. Yeah. They are unemployable because at your locations, we run solo crews yeah. and we can't employ someone that doesn't have a driver's license. Yeah. And so if you're like, well, it's so hard to find employees. You're right. So charge enough now so when this sort of technology comes out, you can buy one. Yeah. And when you do that, now all of a sudden your your market for employees just went through the roof because mm-hmm. they don't have to drive. Yeah. <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. I just thought this this example, I'm pro technology, I'm pro moving forward, but this example is like the perfect like flag for someone who's <laughs> anti-autonomous cars to just wave they so like, it. they can't even park they they're so it. dumb yeah but then they're like what happens when they're do they do that on the road what happens when that happens then two of them come head to head in a parking garage that isn't geo fenced yeah, right if we build a car and we go above 35 miles an hour we're gonna go into oblivion yeah <laughs> like it's just no i agree antiquated ways of thinking because we haven't seen the technology work yet yeah yeah do you think this is an interesting thought insurance rates because if you look at the statistical analysis autonomous cars technically will be safer okay i think will insurance rates go up or down i think the manufacturers will take insurance in-house just like tesla has oh right we've talked about this before i forgot yeah Yeah. because then it's basically if you think you're such a good insure if you're if you think your car is so good insure it if it's going to drive itself insure it for us right and then we will pay you. And then it'll be like, well, whoever has the lowest rates basically is saying that they think their equi- their driverless technology is the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, for- I forgot that we talked about this like a year ago. Yeah. And it's the same thing. I think the point I made is like Apple Care. Yeah. Like Apple stands by their products. You can pay them a subscription to get Apple Care. They'll replace everything, whatever. Recurring tech revenue support. for them. Yep. And then it is, you would literally be able to compare. Like right now, for example, you can compare kind of like the safety of a vehicle simply by just looking across, like saying, okay, if I bought this car, how much would it cost for insurance? If I bought this car, how much would it cost for insurance? And you go to Geico and get like a bunch of rates. You can kind of get where they already know based upon all sorts of data, data of like, car crashes, the cost to repair, the cost of maintenance, how often they break down, et cetera. Yep. And so when now your manufacturer can provide insurance like Tesla has, that will be the like common denominator is like, okay, I have four driverless car options. One is going to cost me $150 a month. This one's going to cost me $50 a month. They probably have higher confidence in their vehicle than this person. Right. So. Yeah, makes sense. Last topic I have for today, unless you have anything else. This is something I saw while I was scrolling on the old Facebook, and I thought it was interesting, and I'll just play it for you. Get your thoughts. Okay. I have memberships at my plumbing business. It's $49 a month and they get priority scheduling, one free yearly maintenance and 10% off all service. The crazy part though is how many people actually wanted this. At first I didn't really know if it worked because it seems weird to pay a subscription for plumbing, but now we have over a thousand members all paying $49 a month and I make about 700,000 every year just from memberships. And the customers obviously loved it, otherwise they would have canceled. All right, now obviously this is some guy Randomly talking on Facebook. <laughs> on a podcast. No. A microphone yeah. in front of his face. <laughs> he's, he's a podcast, so he has authority. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I didn't verify any of this. <laughs> yeah. However, the premise is very interesting. Yeah. Now, we obviously in the lawn care landscape industry, if you do mowing, it is a recurring service. A lot of people do contracts. But what are your thoughts on, could you expand this into lawn care landscaping for someone who doesn't even want weekly mowing. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, you pay us 20, 50 bucks a month, like this guy said, 49 a month, and you get you know, uh, two free mows a year, emergency service if there's a storm or whatever. Like, How could we pitch this for lawn care landscaping? Yeah, the, this, the, the slight different thing is we are maintenance, that is insurance. Right. So maintenance is something that typically is not, like if it doesn't get done within the next hour or two, you're, like, the house isn't gonna fall over. Right. right? If you have a plumbing issue, you do want to be priority. You right. want immediately someone needs to be there because it could be causing tens of thousands, about hundreds of thousands of dollars 
of damage per hour. Right. And so insurance is always something like we just talked about with insurance of cars. Yep. It is a recurring service. You pay for it with the expectation of not needing it. That's a great business model. Yeah. It's like, I sure hope I don't get a crash. <laughs> I sure hope I don't need to call my plumber. Right. But I'm going to buy it anyways just in case. Yeah, yeah. That's a great business model. And it just becomes a metric, a numbers game of like, okay, how much does it cost you to actually deliver on this service, mm-hmm. right? And so lawn care and landscaping, the closest thing I would say is like try to get them on a recurring package like winter services mm-hmm. year round. Yep. Um, and mostly due to the fact that, so for example, giving someone 10% off, you can just put that on an invoice and like mark it up 10%. Totally. So like that, that's a fugazi. Yeah. But like, it's the part of like the reason that plumbing is so like, is very same thing with roofing. You can kind of do this with a mm-hmm. little bit is like, if there's a problem, I need it fixed immediately. I need some sort of priority. Mm-hmm. That's where you can sell insurance. Mm. Um, it's not a warranty either because like they do work. And it has nothing to do with the warranty is this is like, we are going to make sure you get taken care of kind of thing. Uh-huh. So, uh, I, I haven't really found anyone doing this in lawn care a lot because most of them were maintenance right. or not like emergency repair. Yeah. So. The only way I thought about this that I've seen it kind of adjacent in lawn care and landscaping is those in snow markets yeah. that are semi inconsistent. Yep. They're like, hey, you're going to pay me $300 a month and that's going to cover X pushes a month. Yeah. And whether it snows or not, you're paying me 300 a month. Yeah. And the assumption though, is that they need the snow removed so they can get out of their driveway. Exactly. There's some sort of like immediate acute pain. Mm -hmm. That's when you can sell insurance. Like your car gets hit by something. Yeah. Acute pain. You need insurance. Right. Right. Water's leaking out of the, 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 the the pipes and it's pouring into my house. I need someone like acute pain. Right. So, um, you know, it's, snow. It snowed snow. 12 inches I overnight. I can't get out of my yeah, driveway totally. to work. I yeah. need, like, so yeah. whenever the short-term pain, you can sell insurance. Nice. How do we do that? <laughs> yeah, <just laughs> like, like, I just, like, I want to I want to do fertilizer this. fertilizer on the lawn. Just like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, come on, we right out. Yeah. Um, like, I think that, like, we already do it with mowing, but it's just, I feel like, like he's saying, I didn't know there was a market for a $49 a month subscription. Like, my wife and I, we've been homeowners now for three years. Yeah. I would consider that you Fif- would. 50 bucks a month just so an emergency like I don't know how to do any plumbing yeah I'll hand up I have no idea how to do plumbing I don't think I would do that because like even as a landlord maybe once a year maybe once every eight six to eight months yeah I have like an emergency kind of repair yeah and I'm gonna pay an extra usually like 150 dollars to have someone there right away. Right. So then there's like the balance to it. Yeah. Like but I thought I like that it's a, there is a free, so you're paying for it, um, annual assessment of everything. See, that's like also what I'd be there's paying for. Value. Now you're paying $600 a year. That annual assessment, they probably sell for what? 150, 200 bucks, like just a service fee. Yeah. So if, like if you're, you're overpaying. Yeah, I think if your house is worth a lot, it would make sense. Totally. Like if your house is worth a, mm, probably over a million, 1.2 spending a thousand dollars a year on like basically insurance for your plumbing makes sense yeah but there's a thing you pay insurance on your house yeah so if something <laughs> messes up and it does cause a leak you're gonna get it fixed yeah and so you're paying for like extra peace of mind like an umbrella policy 100 percent. yeah so I, i'm not against it i'm hey i just wouldn't do it yeah. because i hate subscriptions yeah i don't think i recurring. would do it i'm just saying i would consider it yeah, like yeah, if, yeah. if someone pitches to me like especially as like a new homeowner you're like oh man yeah like i don't know like i know how to fix like the the lever on my toilet i know how to fix yeah. like the knob on the sink yeah. that's it i don't know how to do anything else with plumbing my so it might be like, nice if i don't use it every month but i have to pay for it every month then i have a problem with it like if i'm using something consistently yeah I, i'm hands up i have a lot of subscriptions especially yeah. around software <laughs> lots of them because they help me in life but when it comes to something i don't use like if i don't use something like a subscription for a month i is immediately on the chopping yeah. block yeah. And so like if I'm not using like actively logging in and using the thing and it's not adding value, man, every month I'd be like forty nine dollars. Oh man, that's like yeah. a dinner. Forty nine dollars again. <laughs> and then, then it's like, okay, well, I've, it's been three months. I could have got someone here within an hour on yeah. emergency service, yeah. just paying the one fifty. That's so, peace of mind. Yeah. And then I'd be like that ten percent. So maybe I should like test them and see if like, on a different yeah, house yeah, yeah. with the price and see if it's actually different. I'd You'd be, want to gamify it. Yeah. But I like it. I think there's value to trying to figure out any sort of, like you were saying, if you can sell the insurance yeah. of your services for a quick pain that I can take off your plate as the, as my customer, you can sell something like this. Yeah. And insurance is one of those things that people just buy and then they never like, when was the last time you changed your auto insurance, the, your home insurance? Like, yeah. People yeah. stick with it for years. Yeah. 
And so um, it's a very, very sticky service. And that's why Warren Buffett makes a lot of money. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I got for today. Okay. Not I, financial advice. Not financial Locked advice. And loaded, dude. Locked and loaded. Go ahead. All right. Uh, my not financial advice is right mowers. <laughs> okay. All right. They, they sent me this hoodie. No free ads. Uh, <laughs> but we did bring them on as a preferred vendor with Augusta. Yeah. And their their team is awesome to 20% work with. Off? Uh, 16 to 22. 16 to okay. 22 kind of ranges on different products. So yeah. if you want to join Augusta, get 16 to 22% off Contact of mowers. Lee at Lee Contact at me. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, but they're great to work with. They're very much... Um, Fam, like kind of family owned, family operated. Ed Wright is still their CEO, and uh, they've just been fantastic to work with. Very, very stand up people and great products. Yeah, so I recommend cool. them. I, honestly, if we were in a market, if Bellingham was in a market that we could do stand ons and we had access to them, it'd, it'd be a no brainer, in my opinion. Everything I've seen, the numbers, the way those machines run, like it's right mowers. So. The right there you go. Choice. That's the right choice. Let's there you go. go. Um, okay, so I would recommend if you haven't upgraded your phone in five years or more, yeah, just go into the deal, the, the uh, phone carrier, and be like, "Hey, what would it cost me to upgrade this thing?" Is that fifteen? This is a fifteen. Oh, nice. Um, I noticed you didn't have the yellow case. My so price went down. <laughs> oh, nice. Like, <laughs> and I got a free phone. I gave them my iPhone eleven that yep. I've had for five and a half years. Yep. And they said, okay, great. Your cost per month is going to go down and you're going to get a free, and that includes the phone. Yeah. This is life. They gave me $800 yeah. for a trade-in of an iPhone 11 because they had a promo going. No on. way. That's yeah, nuts. Dude. And that, that paid for this. Yeah, totally. So I don't even have like a- uh, Monthly. A monthly on yeah. the device. It's paid off. Yeah. And then I love my it. monthly bill went down just because Perfect. their rates have gone down. Yeah. I love technology. It's deflationary yeah. cost. That's why we do need to make sure there's not monopolies. So like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile are always competing. Yep. Bring the prices down, baby. <laughs> so uh, if you're like me and you have great pride in not changing out your phone and yeah. having an old phone, I do recommend yeah. go check out the prices and see if they've come down because I got better service. I got faster. faster. Yeah. Uh, Is that one have the cheaper. Apple chip? The 15s oh, yeah. had the yeah, Apple chip. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, all around better yeah. device uh, for cheaper. And, um, you know, just had to walk in and be like, yo, this is an old yeah, phone. Yeah. What can you do for me? <laughs> yeah. You and I both had 11s. I upgraded to the 13. Okay. Because the 13 was like $300 less than the 5. Yeah, dude. I, he was like, or 15, I'm like, well, excuse can me? I go to like the, um, can I go to a lower, like 14? Yeah. Like, is it cheaper? He's like, no, like it's going to be the same price. Yeah. He's like, we give you $800. And then if you go to the 14, we're going to give you like $600 and then you can use it towards that one. I'm like, so there's no advantage yeah. of me going a model lower. He's like, no, there's not. Yeah. Like, what in the world? <laughs> so I think I paid, I want to say no more than like 900 for the iPhone 11 and I'm getting 800 back for right. promo. Yeah, totally. So I know there's all the Fugazi behind the scenes. They're, they're making their money because I have a three-year contract. Yeah. But I'm not paying for the device. My monthly bill went down. Yeah. Just go to the stinking carrier and be like, hey, this is my plan. Is there any new promotions? And just totally. see what throws your way. Yeah. That's what my wife and I always do. Like, we got these 13s. We traded in our old phones and got 13s yeah. for, like, dirt cheap. Because yeah. we're just like, okay, when are they doing a promo? Yeah. Like, we don't need to upgrade every year, every other year. We'll just wait until there's a good promo and we want to upgrade. But there's timing behind this. You want to go in August. Oh, okay. Because that's right for September when they released a new iPhone. All right, so that makes clearing sense. Out yeah, inventory. that makes sense. So yeah. there is a strategy behind it. Yeah. You always Smart. go in August. September is when they announce the new iPhone yeah. and they inventory up for that and they take pre-orders. You want to get in August. Yeah. That's why they went to the seven ninety nine to get rid of all... Yeah. yeah. And if you don't use Apple, you know, we'll pray for you. Uh, just hop on board. <laughs> Superior products. <laughs> so that's all I got. Cool. Let's go. Like and subscribe.